okay, so uh, so I'll talk about something that uh, I've been thinking a lot about, which is uh, graph uniformization. So the idea is you take a, a big graph and then uh, maybe it looks some way, and then you try to uniformize it so it looks nicer. So, and the reason I say uniformization is because I really, I mean, I intended to hearken back to like uh, conformal uniformization, the Riemann mapping theorem. Obviously, you have to mention people from the 1800s. So, uh, to like Riemann's thesis in 1850, where he proved the Riemann mapping theorem. Um, uh, and so, I can, I can, uh, you know, there there are a number of different ways to you can you can state such a problem, and they actually have many applications to things like unique games conjecture, something called the thin trees conjecture, and so on. Uh, so, the, okay, so the, the classical part is that I want to relate to sort of uh, uniformization Riemannian geometry. The neo part is that I want to do it for graphs. And then, of course, the subtitle of the conference is uh, additive combinatorics. So I, at the end, the punchline will involve Semiretti and at least four applications of Cauchy Schwartz, which is the way <laughs> we are measuring things, I guess, this week. Uh, I heard people in the hallway, you know, I use Cauchy Schwartz six times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> what kind of <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, Good. So the okay. So for this purpose, I'll I'll give a okay. But all of these uh, notions of uniformization that I care about, they have something in common. So let me uh, talk about one problem, hearkening back to one of the first uses of uniformization in Riemannian geometry, and then uh, you will like the framework will be sort of more general. At the end, I'll give some open questions related to rather disparate set of things. Uh, okay. So the the problem I want to talk about is uh, eigenvalues of the of graphs. So, of course, there is a field of spectral graph theory which tries to relate the eigenvalues, the spectrum, the eigenvectors of a graph to geometric and combinatorial properties that the graph has. So let me just uh, give you some, okay, so here's a graph. Now, uh, we'll think about this operator on the graph, which is the Laplacian. So uh, it maps functions on the vertices to other functions on the vertices. Uh, and here's the normalization I'll use, the Laplacian of a graph. Uh, it maps uh, f to the function which takes x to, you look at all of the neighbors of x and you take f of x minus f of y. So you, you might not like this normalization, I don't like this normalization, but it will be the simplest. This is called the combinatorial Laplacian. Uh, okay, so this, this is the operator and I guess the one other thing we should know about this is uh, the quadratic form associated to it. So. The quadratic form, as most people are familiar, measures the, uh, the energy of f over edges of the graph. So I have a function on the vertices. The, if I take the inner product of f with the Laplacian, I get some, uh, some kind of potential energy of f over the edges of the graph. OK. And, uh, and then I want to talk about, so now this thing is a positive semi-definite, has a spectrum, say, like this, uh, and uh, okay, I want to say something about how the eigenvalues of the graph, uh, the eigenvalues relate to the geometric and combinatorial structure of the graph. There are many problems you can state in this way. Uh, let me go back to something uh, very simple. So, uh, uh, in Riemannian geometry, uh, if you go back to uh, 1970. Uh, it was proved, okay, okay, so where's the first place that you can talk about sort of non-trivial things going on with eigenvalues? You can look at eigenvalues of um, surfaces. Okay, so these are very simple objects, and it was proved by Hirsch in 70 that, uh, so I should say, by the way, that if you're coming from geometry, sort of uh, usually lambda 1 is equal, so I will, you know, lambda 2 is the first non-trivial eigenvalue. In Riemannian geometry, lambda 1 is the first non-trivial eigenvalue. But, uh, so what Hirsch proved is that, uh, if you have, uh, so suppose M is some Riemannian metric on the two-sphere. Okay. So you just take some metric on the two-sphere. Uh, then the, actually the, the smallest non-trivial eigenvalue is, uh, is extremal for the flat two-sphere itself. Okay, so uh, you have to normalize by the volume. Okay, but well, this is what Hirsch proved in uh, So this in is 70. the first trivial or second trivial? It's, it's non-trivial. 
Uh, it's the first non-trivial one. The first one is zero. The first this is this. Even, even for manifolds, because say for manifolds. Yeah, even for well, even for man, I didn't define what is the Laplacian, but if you take the, the Laplace Beltrami operator on a manifold, then uh, yeah, you will see that the constant functions are annihilated by it. So, uh, but they so it makes maybe it makes more sense to start the numbering earlier. But uh, this can be it's a matter of aesthetics. Okay, so this was proved in uh, in 1970, and then um, let me say that this will be slightly out of order. Uh, so this is for Riemannian metrics on the two sphere. So you can ask about uh, uh, what happens for say, the graph theoretic version, which would be to look at the second eigenvalue of a planar graph. And uh, Spielman and Tang prove that, uh, okay, so for G planar, that um, you have something like uh, this where for, for G planar. And again, n is the number of vertices, and d max is the maximum degree of the graph. Okay. They didn't actually know about Hirsch's bound. The proofs are very similar. I'll say something in a second about the proof. So uh, can you just uh, repeat Hirsch's bound is for what? For any manifold? For any Riemannian metric on the two sphere. No, no. You, you, yeah. yeah. So you, you can, you can, you know, every such thing you can basically take, you know, you take a, just a, 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 a non-negative function on a two-sphere, it will give you some hills and valleys, and it will give you a Riemannian metric, and you can look at the eigenvalues. Uh, okay, uh, and then in the 80s, after this work of uh, Hirsch, uh, uh, STL asked uh, what, will ha what happens for the rest of the spectrum. So is the, is the flat sphere uh, extremal for the rest of the spectrum? So he asked the, the question, is it the case that you can get some bound like this? Okay. Flat sphere, you mean the normal, you know, just the, the flat sphere means imagine. uniform. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, okay, so it's, yes, uh, yeah. uh, constant curvature. So maybe flat is. Uh, okay, uniform, good. Uh, okay, and then this was resolved, uh, this was resolved by Corvar in 93, so the answer is yes. And then let me mention the question I'll talk about today, which was, uh, also in this paper, Spielman and Tang, they asked, uh, they asked if the same thing is true for graphs. So, so, uh, so this is kind of the simplest setting in which you might want to do some kind of uniformization, and you'll see what it means in a second. Do uh, you have a similar kind of bound? So, uh, well, we can. Let's just assume the degree is constant. But here's the conjecture. That's the question. And let me say that, uh, that uh, well, for all I know, and for all, well, no one ever claimed to me otherwise, that this, uh, the graph case seems stronger than the manifold case. So if you can prove it for the graph case, there is a fairly easy reduction that proves it for the manifold case. This, this direction, uh, I don't know of any such proof. So it seems, it seems genuinely harder to prove it for graphs than for surfaces, but it would be great if somebody came up with, yeah. I thought that Tang resolved it in 2009. But What's that? I thought that Tang resolved it in 2009, but maybe uh, I don't Fortunately, it. I'm also a co-author on, on the paper, so... Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So with, with uh, Kellner, Price, and Tang uh, in uh, 2009, uh, we proved that the answer is, is yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, and uh, yeah, okay, so the, and, uh, and uh, okay, so now let's say something about the proof, and in the process you'll see what I mean by uniformizing a graph, and, uh, and then we'll see where uh, sort of the combinatorial argument comes in. Okay, so uh, let's see, all right, good. Um, okay, so the first thing we have to understand is how can we, how can we, and by the way, feel free to, you know, ask questions at any time. Uh, I have some fear that I could run out of time, and if it's your fault, that's better than if it's my fault. So, so is this is this good job, Gil? Thank you. <laughs> is this picture a smiling person with four eyes? <laughs> <laughs> it, you should ask your therapist what it means when you see a smile everywhere. This is, uh, but Gil uh, is very happy, even when he should be upset. He's always always happy. Okay. Uh, now I'm off. I uh, lost. Forgot what I was doing. Okay. 
Yeah, so okay, so how can you okay, so how can you hope to prove such a thing? Well, first you can write down what is the kth eigenvalue. So you can write down the variational characterization. So let's see, you want to minimize over all subspaces of functions of dimension k, and then look at the maximum over non-zero functions in the subspace. Like this. Here's the, K, the variational definition of the characterization of the kth eigenvalue. Okay, so now first of all, if you want to balance them like this, it's very hard because there is this linear algebraic condition that says you have to find the entire subspace of functions, and then you have to you have to bound this called the Rayleigh quotient for every single one. And uh, I mean, the linear algebraic structure is is separate from the structure of the you know of the Laplacian, right? I mean, it's this this subspace is sort of unrelated to the geometry of the Laplacian. So this is sometimes a difficult thing to do. Uh, so there is something nicer you can try to bound, uh, which is to replace this orthogonality constraint that you have a k-dimensional subspace by some combinatorial uh, property. So here is uh, something else you might like to bound. Instead of looking for a k-dimensional subspace, I'll just look for k-functions. Uh, and I want the force of k-functions to be orthogonal. Uh, so if you're thinking combinatorially, the easiest way to do that is just to have them all have disjoint supports. So, uh, okay, so on any particular vertex of the graph, at most one function is non-zero. Okay? Uh, okay, so then we just, now we just have k-functions. So I'm replacing orthogonality, right, the, whatever basis of functions you have with this space, by a much stronger property that the functions are disjointly supported. Um, and then, okay, and then my then maybe my goal is now just to bound k Rayleigh quotients, okay. And the reason this is nicer is because in order to bound this, I mean now I, now I can think geometrically, right? I have a I have some space, and I'm trying to construct functions of disjoint support, so I can you know, I can construct the function here, and then I can say, okay, I'm not allowed to use this part of the space anymore. I can do this, and you know. okay, so it's somehow you know this is a something that seems easier to reason about. Um, on the, okay, so on the one hand, it's very easy to see that uh, that if you can if you can if you can bound this number, then you can bound this number. Okay, you just take the the corresponding subspace to be the span of these k functions, and you get a factor of two just because edges have two endpoints. Uh, you have to write it down, but it's it's very simple. And you might worry that you're uh, you might worry that you've sort of made the problem much harder for yourself. But actually, there's a a result we proved. Uh, with uh, Cheyenne uh, and Luca last year that says uh, actually uh, this sort of combinatorial eigenvalue is never too much worse than the corresponding algebraic eigenvalue. So something like, uh, okay, something like this. So uh, there's no quantifiers here, but this doesn't have anything to do with so sorry, this 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 slide of the board has nothing to do with uh, planar graphs. This is for any graph. So you take any graph. Uh, in fact, you can take any sort of Markov operator. It's very general. Uh, if you if instead of looking over k-dimensional subspaces of functions, you look over just disjointly supported functions, the or the corresponding eigenvalue does not lose too much. Okay. So uh, we won't need this, but it just sort of gives someone faith that you're not bounding something crazy. And in fact, in the paper, we prove that if if the graph is is nice, so if the graph is planar, then like you know, so the, in the planar case actually, you can just get some really some absolute constant. Okay? So okay, so the bounding this is sort of uh, uh, is without loss. Okay, so this is what we're gonna try to do now. To bound uh, to to find k functions supported on the graph, each of which has a small Rayleigh quotient. If you think about what it means, we're trying to find k functions, each of which is which are disjointly supported and each of which is pretty smooth. We're trying to keep the functions from being too crazy. Okay. That's the goal. Any questions about this? So now, what I want to say is that uh, the difficult part of this goal. Uh, Jens, yes. Is, Jens, is the paper that does this for uh, for the matrix on the sphere also constructs disjointly supported functions? The paper also constructs disjointly supported functions. Uh, it's a bit. Uh, I, if you if you want to, I can tell you afterwards how it works and why it doesn't hold for the and why it doesn't seem to work for graphs. But it's basically because the paper uses the uniformization theorem, which is just weaker in the case of graphs. And there's not enough, uh, it uses it in a very strong way. And it's, 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 uh, it doesn't seem like enough 
uh, to have just the graph version. OK, so let me, OK, so now I want to construct k disjointly supported functions. Now you have to take this leap of faith. Uh, the difficult part of doing that is that when the graph, when a graph is given to me, it looks something like this. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, it doesn't have a very nice, you know, if I just look at a graph, it just, you know, with sort of like the, the base geometry where each edge has length one, the, I don't see this necessarily there's some nice structure there. It can be looking crazy. So really, the hard part about constructing these functions is spreading the graph out so that there's enough space to construct them, OK? So this is, uh, OK. So, uh, OK, so I want to put some nice metric on the graph. And once I have a nice metric, it will be fairly easy to construct these functions. So what does a, what does a metric mean? Okay. So uh, you can think of edge-weighted metrics or vertex-weighted metrics. For this purpose, I'll use vertex weights. OK, so I have, a, I have a weight function on the vertices. And then associated with this weight function, I can just look at the lengths of shortest paths in the graph. So the, this distance will be the, uh, uh, so the distance between x and y will be the, the w length of the shortest xy path in g. Okay. So this is how I'll think about deforming the graph. I can put weights on the vertices, and it makes certain things farther apart and certain things closer together. Um, and then if you want to solve this problem, let me tell you, uh, OK, what you need is a, is, a, is a way of putting weights on the graph that spreads the mass out a fair bit. So, uh, so here's something which suffices. Um, to have a weight that satisfies, on the one hand, that the, say, the average uh, uh, weight squared of a vertex is at most 1. And OK, so this is one thing. We have some bounds on the total weight we can put on the, on the graph. And I want to have some kind of constraints. You know, it's not good for me if the graph is sort of crumples up. So I want to have some kind of constraints that say that the that no small that no sufficiently large piece of the graph can be trivial. Okay, so the non-triviality constraint will be. Okay, I w Julia, I warned you that it was running out. Uh, yeah, the non-triviality constraint will be. Okay, something like this, and uh, for the case of for the case of trying to bound the kth eigenvalue, this is the kind of weight that one would need to find. Okay, so uh, and if you really want to do this, uh, again, this is everything here is general except for the value of delta, which will depend on the graph. But uh, uh, if you want to spread the space out, here's what I mean. You assign weights to the vertices, like you can think about it as a Riemannian metric on the graph, such that the total volume is bounded. Uh, and then you would like that every large enough subset, so in fact here the, we can put, doesn't really, uh, size bigger than n over k, uh, doesn't collapse in this metric. Yeah. Sorry, question. At the distance, you actually include the weights at the endpoints? Uh, yeah, but it, I mean, yes, you include the weights at the endpoints. If you really, you could do. There are a few things you could do, but they're all the same up to a constant factor, so it doesn't really matter. OK, so the point is that if you want to construct these functions, uh, it suffices to find some way of spreading out the graph. And to do that, uh, it suffices to find a weight satisfying these kind of properties. This is You can think about this as the, uh, some kind of Riemannian metric on the graph where the sets of measure 1 over k don't collapse. They're all big. Okay, So I claim that it, su it suffices to uh, find such a thing. All right. Um, And now we're, okay, and, and I've set this up in a nice way with that's uh, uh, sort of, I, I skipped a few steps in, in what you might do at home if you were uh, doing it by hand, uh, so that actually the space of all such things is a convex set. So uh, if you think about this, for instance, as a convex program where the, the variables are the W of E's, then this, this, is a, this, is a set of, this is a set of linear constraints, and this is a uh, I mean, this is a sphere, so this is a convex set. So this is, this is a convex set. So in particular, to find such a weight, I can apply duality. This is, sort of, this is why I set things up like this. The natural thing you might do uh, at home is to have a, some kind of square here, but then this makes it no longer a convex set because it's the, it becomes the complement of a, of a sphere. OK, so there is a Cauchy-Schwartz hidden somewhere there. OK, 
That's not doesn't count as one of the Cauchy Schwartzes, by the way. Okay. So now you want to construct uh, such a metric. I guess I should say that uh, if you only care about the case k equals two, so which will explain how how both of these things work. If you only care about the case k equals two, then there is a nice way to do it. Okay. So look at k equals two. Uh, and now you have a planar graph. So there is a the Kobe uh, uh, sort of a circle packing representation of a planar graph, which says that every every planar sorry this is a smile with four eyes uh, that uh, every planar graph can be drawn uh, as the tangency graph of a bunch of disks on the unit sphere. Okay. All right. So this is how a tangency graph works. Uh, right, and so on. So if you if you okay, so now continue drawing the graph. Uh, I stop for sake of the sake of time. If you set the weight of a vertex equal to the radius of the corresponding disk, right, v, okay, uh, then uh, well then you have a bound on the total volume, right? W v squared is at most. I mean, it's at most, the, this is the, say, the unit sphere in R3, so this is at most some constant. Um, uh, and then if you want to get this, uh, this condition just for sizes of sets of size at least half, it will not, you cannot just take any old circle packing and get it, but uh, if you apply an appropriate Morbius transformation, then this condition will be true for k equals 2. Okay? That's a non-trivial fact. It requires a topological argument that the, actually Hirsch and Spielman and Tank came up with <coughs> independently. Uh, but there exists... There's a rich enough family of, of circle preserving maps that you can take one of them, which sort of, sorry, which covers the, such that when you apply it, the, the sort of the graph is spread out enough on the sphere as to satisfy this constraint for k equals two, okay? So, so this is a good this is a good uniformization of the graph for for small k. No one knew how to do it for k equals three, not in the Ramanian setting, not in the graph setting, okay? So, 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 so yes. Yeah, so, 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 not sure I understand how you get distance from the. It's just the shortest path distance. So, <coughs> uh, the sum of the weights of the vertices occurring the in the path. Oh, well, did you? Sorry. What was the other interpretation? Uh, that the length of an edge was the different, the absolute value of the difference of the weights. I see. And the length of a path was the sum of those. Guys. Okay. So this is my mistake. I thought, uh, but now we're on the same page. So the the length of a path is the the, the uh, given a path. The length of the path is the sum of the weights of the vertices occurring in the path. The shortest path is you take the infimum over all such paths. You have a question, guy? Okay. Uh, why, do want, uh, why do you want the, co the first constraint to be quadratic instead of linear? Uh, this one. Uh, why do you want this constraint to be quadratic instead of linear? Well, if you look at the, I mean, what you should ask is why the second constraint is linear instead of quadratic. No, no, I mean, if you look here, you have uh, the ratio of two quadratic terms, so it makes sense you want something quadratic. Uh, here I've used you know, here it was safe to use Cauchy Schwartz, here it wasn't. Uh, uh, um, in this technique with circle packing, what's specific to k equal to 2? Why doesn't it work for higher k? Um, basically, you can rewrite this constraint so that it's just a single constraint for k equals 2. It, uh, you know, it, it looks like it should, could be n choose n over 2 constraints. But for k equals 2, you can write this as a single constraint. And then you have a single, you know, you have essentially, uh, let's see, you have essentially a one parameter family of Morbius transformations, and it's enough to get this single constraint correct. But the second you have more than a single constraint, there's not a rich enough family of circle preserving transformations to get this right. Okay, so the the last step uh, is now uh, to understand this extremal, these extremal metrics uh, by a connection to um, uh, to flows in the graph. Okay, so uh, it doesn't mean like Ricci flow or a, uh, any kind of geometric flow. Although, okay, it's a good question whether the two flows have anything in common. Uh, uh, okay, so what is a flow? So let's let P be the set of all the, say, simple paths in our graph. And then a flow is just a function that maps paths to non-negative numbers. And I want to associate two values to this flow. One is the, something like f of uv, which will be the, the total flow between 
u n v. Right? So have u, have v. There are many paths with n point u n v, and if I sum f along all these paths, I get some number that's the flow between u and v. Yeah. And uh, the other thing I want is some is uh, this notion, which is the amount of flow going through the vertex u. So this is the so basically, given any, any non-negative functional on paths, I can define these two quantities associated with them. This is the amount of flow. Uh, this has to have to be simple paths. Say it again. This have to be simple paths. Uh, you're going to minimize something eventually, so it, it will not make sense to take non-simple paths, but let's say simple paths. Uh, OK, so these are flows. These turn out to be the dual objects to metrics, uh, just because when you write down the constraints of the triangle inequality, uh, well, the flows are the dual variables corresponding to the constraint, one constraint for every path. Uh, and then what kind of uh, sort of, if you want to find the, the best metric here, okay, so for instance, you want to maximize this value delta, uh, what does it correspond to in the flow setting? Well, it corresponds to uh, a problem that looks the following. You want to look over all flows, you want to minimize sort of the, the L2 norms of the congestion at the vertices. Okay, so you, you look at every vertex, how much flow is going through it. You want to minimize the square subject to some constraints. Okay, subject to some constraints. Um, so let me tell you uh, first what the constraints are for k equals 2. Once you rewrite the program. Okay, so this is only... Okay, so for k equals 2, it suffices to have the following constraints. Just that the... Uh, the flow will send uh, one unit between every pair of vertices. Okay, so like I have this flow which is sending one unit between every pair of vertices, and now my goal is to, uh, if you think about it, for duality, in order to show that it's not so clear because I didn't write, the, but in, in order to show that you can get such a, a large value of delta. In other words, in order to show that you can spread out the the graph using this uh, construction. It's, uh, one needs to show that for, for every flow satisfying these constraints, the total uh, sort of uh, congestion incurred is large. That's what's required here. Okay? And the larger you can... Uh, and in fact, if you look at optimality, the, the extremal metric you should take is you take the flow that minimizes this, and then the, the weight of a vertex, the sort of Riemannian weight of the vertex, is, just becomes the, the amount of flow going through it. So you, if you think about the flow, you set up this flow problem, the flow tries to distribute itself so as to minimize this condition, uh, at optimality, that actually deforms the graph into the metric you want. Uh, this is a general kind of thing that goes on in many settings, not just this one. Uh, so what's the analog of this flow in the manifold setting? Okay, good question. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can, you, you can just construct by hand the same thing you was using, you know, uh, in, you know, it's more delicate, but that's not so useful. Probably want to have some other kind of idea of what's going on. It's a great question. Uh, but, okay, so how, how, do you, how are you going to analyze such a thing? I'll tell you in a second. Okay, so for, for, for larger k, there's some other constraints that you can hear that you can put. Uh, I can tell you about them in a second if there's time. But let me tell you the basic mechanism for how to prove that there is a lot of, that this must be large, okay? So you can just think about this very simple situation. I have a I have a, a planar graph. You know, here are the vertices of the planar graph. Uh, and I have to send from every, between every pair of vertices a one unit of flow. And I want to minimize this. So what can I do? OK, so the first simplification uh, that we'll make without saying much is that uh, we can assume that uh, the flow is integral. Okay, in other words, we can assume that the flow from u to v just concentrates for every pair on a single path. That's just by randomized rounding. It's a, you know, if, uh, if you have some kind of setup like this where I send, you know, I send some, some flows like this, then just independently for every pair, choose uh, one of the paths with probability pi. Okay, and then if you just check, uh, you'll see that you don't lose anything, that there exists an integral flow which is as good as the, as the original. So now I have this graph and everybody is sending, uh, has between themselves and every other vertex one path. And if you just open up this square for integral flows, you see that 
except for the diagonal term, which is not interesting. The, this is equal to the number of intersections between the paths. Every time I see an intersection, I get, when you open up the square, I get a, you know, I get, I have to count one. Okay? So if you, uh, so, uh, okay? So what, yes, what you're really counting here is the number of intersections between flows from different points. Okay? And that's the same even if you have more constraints. Uh, okay, so now let's, uh, let's employ this, uh, A theorem. So, okay, so actually here it's quite simple, but if this was a planar graph, so this is drawn in the plane, and I draw between every pair of points a, a red line, then what I'm trying to do is draw the complete graph on n vertices in the plane and minimize the number of crossings, which is a very well studied problem. Uh, so, let me say what you can. It's a very simple bound which a lot of applications, I mean, you can use it to prove Semmerati Trotter. You can use it to prove the best sum product theorem over the reals. Uh, so it's independently due to Leighton and also to Aitai, Schwartal, Newborn, and Semmerati. Uh, so for any graph G, you try to draw the graph. Well, maybe I should use a different letter. I already used G for our graph. For any graph H, if you try to draw H in the plane, then uh, if H is fairly dense, you have to have lots and lots of crossings between the edges. Uh, so the crossing number of H is at least the number of edges cubed divided by the number of vertices squared as long as there is some kind of, okay, I guess there's a constant here. Uh, as long as the number of edges is not too small. So you get lots and lots of intersections when you try to draw this graph. So actually, for the k equals 2 case, this completely finishes the, the proof. Uh, it says that uh, uh, in the k equals 2 case, it said that this must be at least n to the fourth. Well, OK, sorry, times a constant. So a constant times n to the fourth. Because we're drawing the complete graph. Let's see, the complete graph has like uh, n choose 2 edges cubed divided by n squared, which is. Uh, Okay, good. It's about n to the fourth. So in the, in the case of k equals 2, actually, you're completely done. Uh, you see that the, con that the sum of the squares of congestion must be constant times n to the fourth. And then, of course, we didn't do it and go through all the steps. But if you, if you go back over here and you see what you get, uh, uh, it's the right value. Okay. Uh, for the complete graph, I don't think you need this sophistication. For the complete graph, you don't need this kind of sophistication. It's a trivial argument. Uh, you just, uh, well. You just use counting and the fact that you cannot draw the complete graph on five vertices in the plane with no crossings. And then you do double counting and you're fine. Uh, yeah, so for the, for the complete graph, you don't need this. But once you want to go to higher k, this becomes essential. Okay? So let me tell you the, the main inequality that we proved there that lets you, uh, that lets you say something for... Okay, so I didn't tell you what the constraints are here, but I'll tell you the inequality and... <laughs> and just take, I mean, and uh, uh, you'll have to accept it and be happy. Uh, you can be sad if you want as well. I can't control people's emotions despite continued efforts. Anyway, uh, yeah. So here, here's a theorem uh, about uh, sort of uh, that's actually quite. You know, it turns out to be fairly difficult to prove. Um, okay, so. But it's, it's the combinatorial theorem you need to uniformize things uh, where you don't want subsets of measure 1 over k to collapse. This, is, uh, this, was, this was useful just if you don't want very, very big sets not to collapse in the metric. Uh, OK, so let mu uh, be a measure on subsets of v. Um, and then I'm going to define a weight function using this mu. Uh, so define. W of U V, this is going to be the probability under choosing a set according to, to mu that U and V are both in the set. Okay, so I define this uh, weight function. So it's the probability that two points occur at the same time in the set. Um, and now, what do I want to do? Okay, so here is the theorem we prove in the paper 
with Shenghua from uh, 2009, um, that uh, given any such measure, okay. So given this weight, uh, you, can, you can, instead of having crossing number inequalities, you can talk about crossing weight inequalities. So I have a weighted graph, I try to draw it whenever I see an intersection between a pair of edges, I pay the product of their weights. Okay. It's, uh, okay. So I claim that if you, draw the, if you draw the complete graph, or any graph with, given this, with such a weight function, then the total crossing weight is at least uh, is at least this. Okay, so this is the main technical theorem. Uh, the total crossing weight you incur is at least 1 over n times the expected size of the set squared to the 5 halves. Uh, and this, I mean, this uses, and, and I, I guess I should say that this uses this theorem as a black box. So if, but you have to apply it to many, many different graphs. Is this, yeah. this a special case of that? Uh, if I had stated this slightly more generally, uh, then it would be, but at the moment it's not. Uh, but uh, if you, I guess what, sort of one thing to say to see how it relates back is that uh, if your measure is concentrated on sets of size at least n over k, so if mu is supported on such sets, then the thing with the, the example which shows this is tight is just to choose your distribution, you partition your n vertices into k sets of size n over k, and the distribution which shows this is tight is just to choose one of these k sets uniformly at random. Okay? So the, the, the extremal distribution for this inequality is really the dual telling you exactly where to build your bump functions uh, so that you get an upper bound on the eigenvalue. OK. Uh, yeah. So, um, OK. And there is a. Yeah. This, this is sort of as, I mean, this, this has the feelings of sort of many kind of theorems we've seen here. It has a density increment argument and, uh, as I said, a number of applications of the Cauchy Schwartz. Uh, let me not uh, belabor this. I just want to say two things about this. Um, uh, one is about sort of these crossing number inequalities in general, and then the other is an open question. Yeah. So the first thing is, yeah. Oh, this constant? Yeah. yeah, this is central. This is crucial. So, and it's this is the right bound. The right bound. Yeah. So it's tight for all ranges of the size of the set. And I should say that, you know, in order to in order to prove the theorem, you only need to prove you would only need to prove such a theorem for measures which are concentrated on sets of size n over k. But in order for the induction to work, sort of, you need this more general kind of statement. Okay. Uh, so I guess two things are in order here. Um, one interesting thing is that. As, uh, as was pointed out, this, I mean, the, the validity of this crossing number inequality ha doesn't have much to do with uh, planar graphs. It has only to do with the existence of sort of small forbidden substructures. So for instance, uh, although there is no, although there is not any easily accessible notion of sort of like what, uh, uh, sort of, of, a un of a uniformization for three-dimensional graphs in the conformal sense, these techniques still work, for instance, if you're, uh, you know, okay, so suppose you're in R3 and your graph was the nerve of some sphere packing in R3 with the constraint that uh, that adjacent, these are in R3, they look like they're in R2. Okay. They're happy little spheres. Uh, yeah, as long as the adjacent spheres have, uh, as long as they're radii within a constant factor, then these techniques also work here. And the reason is because you can also identify forbidden substructures here. And so the crossing techniques go through. It's an interesting way in which uh, sort of you can generalize crossing number inequalities to things that are sort of not two-dimensional. You can go, I don't know if there are any other applications of this, but you can prove spectral bounds on, on higher dimensional graphs. That's one thing. And then, I guess, uh, I want to conclude with a question about uniformization, uh, which is an, of a very different sort. So this was very low dimensional. Uh, I like it because it connects sort of to uh, sort of classical Riemannian geometry. Uh, but suppose you wanted to do something like you wanted to attack the unique games conjecture or uh, 
some other problems. Let me give a uniformization problem. Uh, of a high dimensional nature, uh, which I think is very important. Uh, and the point is that uh, if you try to solve it, you end up in a similar kind of setting. You have extremal metrics, you, have, you, have, you need to analyze some flows, and I just don't know how to do it well enough. So here's the problem. Some of you have seen this problem before. Unfortunately, some of you have seen it many times before. Uh, okay, but, uh, but, <laughs> but it's, still on the, it's still open, so shame on you. Uh, OK, uh, suppose that the graph is a vertex expander. So what it means is just that uh, if, I, if I look at the vertex neighborhood of a subset of nodes, then it grows by some constant factor. The constant factor is not so important. Uh, I guess I should put some constraint on the size of the set. So every set of size at most uh, half grows by 10%. Okay. Uh, Note, note that this is in the vertex sense. I'm looking at the vertex neighborhood. I didn't say anything about the degrees of this graph. Unlike the, most of the expanders we've seen, the degrees could be huge. Okay? Uh, so here's my question. Uh, so, so, I mean, this graph could look very bad, all right? Because I didn't say anything about the degrees. You can do all kinds of things. Like, you can take the product of a graph with some, uh, with some kind of tiny complete graph, which will, you know, make it, will sort of, make it look locally very dense, whereas globally it could be sparse. Uh, th this graph could sort of like the actual true nature of the geometry of this graph could be, could be very uh, hidden. Okay? So I want, to say, I want to say something about uniformizing it so it's, it's more apparent. Okay, so here's the, here's the conjecture. The conjecture is that there exists a random walk supported on G. Okay? What does it mean? Uh, there's a random walk that goes along the edges of G. How, what, what do you have to choose? You get to choose the probability. When, you, when you're sitting at a vertex, you get to choose the probability that you go over, which edges you go over. Okay, the conjecture is that there exists a random walk supported on G uh, that mixes uh, to the uniform distribution in uh, order log uh, N steps. This is the conjecture, okay? So if G was a constant degree expander, then you can just throw your hands up and you finish because you know you mix in order log n steps. But if G is some possibly, you know, different graph where sort of the, uh, the structure is obscured by the, you know, I can even, I'll even let you put, you know, you can put a bunch of self loops in G. This will slow the random walk down to an arbitrary extent. But when you can choose what to do, you can just put, you know, you can take these self loops with weight zero, so you don't have to take them. Uh, so, I can prove it for uh, for log n squared uh, mixing time, and if you could prove it for log n, it would have lots of uh, applications. For instance, it would give a sub-exponential time 1.9 approximation of vertex cover. Okay, uh, a sub-exponent like you could get vertex cover is a problem on graphs. You know, uh, getting better than the two approximation is probably very hard. With so we think. But if you can solve this, you will get a 1.9 approximation, not in polynomial time, but in time 2 to the, you know, and in fact, 2 to the n to the 0 0.001. And in fact, you know, and this has 2 to the n to the delta. You, know, you can prove this version, all log n squared. Yeah, you can prove log n squared. And this has no implication for this? Uh, it has an implication that you can solve the problem in exponential time, but that's <laughs> less. <laughs> So Less interesting. Your, your conjecture is as a provocation, or you really conjecture it? Because no. so you, you really <laughs> <laughs> so you Gil, you just learned what a troll is at dinner a few nights ago, right? So now are you asking if I'm trolling, right? No, 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 no. You, it's, it's legitimate in mathematics. You <laughs> but you believe that there is a sub-exponential Yes, I mean, and I, I mean, I was on sabbatical here last year, and you know, six months of my time was wasted trying to prove it. So I believe it this much. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me end there. Thanks. Any questions for James? Yeah. yeah. So, can you explain what's the relation to vertex power? 
And uh, if you want to solve it, on a, you are assuming your graph is a vertical expander. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Assumption of your no. Okay. So how is it related? Uh, you write down some semi-definite program. So if you uh, uh, if you cannot solve the semi-definite program by some uh, straightforward method, it means that uh, it means that the vertices are sort of embedded in some high-dimensional space. You can build a graph on them, which is a vertex expander. Now, if the vertex expander had some nice mixing properties, it would give you some kind of local global relationship between the graphs. So the fact that uh, basically local mixing means that local correlation of functions along, say, edges corresponds to global correlation in the graph. So basically, uh, if you could, so you get this, you will, if you cannot solve the problem, you will get this vertex expander embedded there. If you could put some weights on it, so the random walk mixed fast, it would say that actually the, the semi-definite program cannot be doing very good. Because it would say that the fact that it's doing well along edges means it's also sort of, uh, means the fact that the, the SDP solution is correlated on edges means it's also correlated for random pairs, which will contradict some of the constraints. This is probably not useful or... Mm, not really, but okay. uh, another we can, question. Yeah. Uh, so you say existence of this random walk, so yes. and this is enough. Yes. Are you enumerating, uh, because you're just saying, you're not saying that uh, you need to find it. Well, there's always this, okay, so first of all, uh, there is a way possibly to find it efficiently, assuming it exists, but, but even besides this, at least, you know, in all these things, getting the value of the vertex cover is already an interesting problem. So, even, so if you can do this, it would, it would bound the value of the semi-definite program. So you You're just, saying that there's no integrality. There would be no integrality, yet. Whether you can construct it is a different matter, although, okay, the answer to this is a little more subtle, but... The, I mean, so then you should say you should not say that there is an algorithm. You should say that. What do you mean? Yeah, I mean there is an algorithm for outputting the value. To, uh, there is just an algorithm that would find. No, that's a, that's an ugly conjecture. This one is very nice. This is an L one or L two? Okay, so it's a good question. Here you can even here uh, it's L two mixing time suffices, but here I, the conjecture uh, is for L infinity mixing. You know, make it as strong as possible. But, oh, but L2 mixing would suffice for the application. Yeah. So if, if you replace uh, the part of the conjecture of the random walk on the graph by a random walk on, uh, not, not a random walk to adjacent uh, nodes, but a random walk to nodes that are a little bit further Yes, then Yuval has a, has a paper, yes. Uh, I do? Uh, yeah, that's why you're asking. So that would, uh, uh, there's a paper of Nora Rabani and Sinclair which says that if you allow your random walk to be supported not on the edges of the graph, but on, edge, on pairs of distance at most root log n in the graph, then you can do it. What, what if it's shorter? I mean, this version of the... Yeah, so uh, if, if, you would like, if you go to log n to the one-fourth or something, yeah, something, then I don't know you what don't happens. Know. Yeah. So <clears throat> we know that there is a, a strong connection between congestion and the eigenvalues, and so basically you are building your proof on that. Yes. But <clears throat> so somehow usually the, uh, the it goes in the other way. Like you you have some you know some eigenvalue gap, and then you deduce that the congestion is is small. Let's say because the eigenvalue gap is is large. Right. So but. So, but here you are going in the other way, but you need some very precise thing. So is there like a precise way of going from the eigenvalues uh, to the congestions? Like if you know the first key eigenvalues, that you can say something better than just if you know the first, if you know the, just the eigenvalue, yeah. I mean, so usually these, these congestion arguments are used to put lower bounds on the eigenvalues, right? That's usually the, I mean, you, you put some nice graph with an eigenvalue gap inside your graph. Uh, and now you're saying, can you, can you say the version of this which would, which would bound more of the spectrum? I mean... Yeah, so you know, so you know the spectrum pretty precisely, but not only the first, block, uh, I mean, the value, but the first k. And can you say something more about the congestion? So here now you know a lot about the congestion, and so you deduce information about the first k eigenvalues. So can you go in the other way? I, I, I believe the answer is yes, up to a logarithmic factor in the eigenvalue bound. 
logarithmic factors sometimes are not so important. For this problem, logarithmic factors would crush you, but uh, I think the answer is yes if you're willing to lose a logarithmic factor. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at the flow problem, which is the dual of funding and extreme metric, yeah. for a larger k, the problem of funding and extreme metric is a harder problem. Yes. More constrained. So you would expect the dual to be less constrained for larger k. Yes. Which but means that for larger k, it has more constraints. Uh, no, they're just they're just longer to write down. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. No. So you have extra weaker period. constraints, which means that the structure theorem has to be stronger in order to prove that any such system has a large congestion. Yeah. They're they're they are weaker than this constraint. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.